Okay, so Jupiter's legacy deserves a big breakdown, and there's a lot to explain about its twist ending. The show is based on the graphic novel series of the same name by Mark Miller, and in all honesty, it's one of the best comic book runs I've ever read. The new season of the Netflix show adapts roughly the first two and a half issues of it, and because of this, there's a lot left out in terms of the overall arc. Throughout this video, we're going to be discussing the show's ending, where things could be going in the future, and how the series changed things from the original graphic novels. Without the way, welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show. I'm your host, Paul. Now let's get into our ending explained of Jupiter's legacy. Okay, so the story centers around Sheldon Sampson, a wealthy businessman who lost everything after the stock market crash in 1929. After his father ended his own life, Sheldon started to be haunted by visions of him and a mysterious island. After a lot of back and forth, Sheldon traveled to this island with members of his family and friends, one of which was last seen doing a spread for Tony Stark. Big spread. Now, upon arriving there, they came across an alien doorway that took them to what I think might be Jupiter, although it could be Uranus. Upon returning from space, they all looked like they'd taken asteroids, and thus started the Jupiter's legacy, though I think Saturn would have had a nice ring to it, eh? ba bum cha And although this arc takes place roughly across six pages in the source material, the series expands it into a massive episode spanning storyline that adds a lot of weight to why the characters go on the arcs that they do. The season jumps back and forth between two time periods, with the first one being the origin story and the latter being them in their winter years as they try and comprehend the way that the world is. As a superhero group called the Union, they stood for truth, justice and the American way. Sheldon, or rather the Utopian, forced each member to live by a code that meant they wouldn't get involved in politics or ever take a life. Whether this is still relevant today is something that he and the rest of the group wrestle with, and it becomes a big driving force in the series. Now, Sheldon viewed the world as very much being black and white, but with things devolving into shades of grey, an insurrection starts up within the group led by his brother Walter. Walter possesses psychic powers and views himself as someone who could have really changed humanity on a global scale, instead of being relegated to simply stopping bank robbers because his brother said so. Walter was never the favourite, and it's clear that he harbours a lot of resentment to being stuck in his shadow. The season is very much about him putting the pieces in place to create an uprising against him, and come the end of the show, we discover that he created a clone of a supervillain called Black Star, which he used as a weapon. After almost wiping out the Union, Sheldon's son Brandon stepped in to save the day, and he crossed the line by killing Black Star in order to save his father. This disappointed his dad to some degree, as he would have rather died than have the code broken, and Walter's plan is very much about making Brandon realise that his dad's view of the world is outdated, and that he has to go. He wants to push Brandon away from his father by creating a bad atmosphere between them, which we witnessed throughout the series. I promise that's the last terrible space pun I'll do. Now that's pretty much Walter's plan in a nutshell, and he views humanity as being unable to look after itself, thus he wants to remove the Utopian from power so that he can come in and take over the planet. Now though this series itself doesn't tackle this, I think we should look to the backstory in the comics to explain some of the things going on here. You see, in 1929, Walter could have actually saved the family business, and thus his father's life. However, he was talked down from doing what he thought was right by his brother and father, and because of this, he harbours a lot of resentment. Walter even drops the line, No one knows what they're doing except for me, showcasing that he believes he must take control. Because of the recession and politics, the modern world is facing a similar dilemma to what it was all the way back in 29, and thus he believes that if he's ignored again, dire consequences will follow. However, there comes a ray of hope in Sky Fox, the mortal enemy of Walter, who appears at one point in the series. Sky Fox is a very important character in the show, and when we look at the comics, the pair have a long-standing rivalry. Now, time codes are linked below if you want to skip ahead to a certain section, but I feel the best way to talk about the ending is to first discuss the history of the Union, then what happens after the ending with Sheldon and Brandon, and the big character arc that Chloe goes on. Now, the prequel story, Jupiter's Circle, reveals that after they gained their powers, the group initially tried to do good, but they found that politics always got in the way. It's revealed that Blue Bolt was actually gay, and that photographs of him were secretly taken by the FBI. Blackmailed by J. Edgar Hoover, he almost gave up the names of the group, but attempted to take his own life instead. 
Hoover backed off after Blue Bolt blackmailed him with evidence of his own gay relationship, and thus the Union decided to stay away from politics completely, all whilst abiding by their own rules. George aka Sky Fox was commissioned to build the Supermax prison that we see throughout the series, but tensions between him and Walter grew even stronger due to the former always rubbing him the wrong way. George broke up with his girlfriend Sonny, who almost immediately started dating Walter, and this drove George crazy. He believed that Walter was actually using his superpowers to psychically make her fall in love with him, and though he could never prove it, George ended up leaving the union over it. George stopped being a superhero, but one day he did have an epiphany. George believed that the alien technology hadn't been given to them to keep the world the same as they'd once thought. Rather, he believed that they were blessed with these incredible abilities in order to change it. Whereas Sheldon thought that they should stay removed from the bigger things, George believed that they had to get involved to make things better on a bigger scale. Thus, he attended the 1965 LA riots and forced the police to stand down. When Vietnam happened, he kidnapped the vice president and held him to ransom, turning the tide of what he viewed as an unjust war. Sky Fox was labelled a supervillain, but when the criminal Hobbs, a version of which we meet in the series, stripped the Union of their powers and tossed them into a dark matter doorway, he stepped in to save the day. Sky Fox was accepted back into the Union, but Walter revealed to him that he actually did use his mind tricks on Sonny, and this sent George off the deep end. The bear had a battle that almost destroyed an entire city, and Sheldon stepped in in order to break them up. Sky Fox tried to tell Sheldon that Walter had been mind controlling Sonny, but it ultimately fell on deaf ears, and the Utopian believed his brother over his friend. In episode 8, Sky Fox actually hints towards this battle and discusses how the last time he saw Walter, that the Union beat him to a pulp. Sky Fox was arrested and put in the Supermax, but saying as he built it, he was able to escape and the villain wasn't seen again. Now, over the years, though Walter came to hate George, he realised that he was right and that the Union couldn't stay stuck in the past. Thus, he enacted this uprising that we see play out in the series. Now, the comics actually differ slightly from the season, as in those, there was no clone of Black Star. Though the series pulls the fight between the Union and the villain directly from the pages and panels of the work, they do deviate heavily. In the comics, Walter entered his mind much like how we see in the beach scene, however, he simply held him in place whilst the Union beat him on the outside. Brandon doesn't even show up for this fight in the comics, and though his friends are there, they aren't killed. Instead, what drives a wedge between him and his father happens when Brandon tries to carry a ferry across the sky that he almost drops due to his drunkenness. His father saves the day, but berates him and makes him feel completely useless. This is when Walter sinks his claws in, and Brandon becomes angry that his father neglected him and his sister Chloe when they were younger. Now from this point onwards, we're going to be doing some big spoilers from the comics, and whilst they might change things up in the series, I do think that the plot will probably go this way. Also, if you're enjoying this video, then please hit the thumbs up button, and make sure you subscribe for breakdowns like this each and every day. Okay, so because Walter can't beat Sheldon himself, he convinces Brandon that he has to be the one to do it. He says that when he kills Sheldon, he will take his place, and due to the inferiority complex he's developed by the fact his father told him he wasn't good enough, this tactic works. After faking an attack, the Utopian is ambushed by several superheroes who Walter has convinced to join his side, and they all stand around and beat him, similar to how Julius Caesar was betrayed by those closest to him. The ultimate betrayal comes in when Brandon steps forth and murders his father, seemingly taking his place. However, Walter asks what's the first thing you want to do to help your fellow man, and Brandon's reply is, actually, I'm not entirely sure, what do you think, Uncle Walter? It's a moment that still gives me goosebumps to this day, and Walter is of course now in control, using Brandon as a weapon to take over the world. Now elsewhere, we also watch as Chloe returns home after learning she's pregnant with Hutch's child. Her mother is killed by Walter in front of her, and just before she's about to be murdered too, she is saved by Hutch. The pair are forced to go on the run, and their child Jason becomes a new superhero. Now the latter part of the work very much focuses on him. Walter rules over the entire planet, and the second graphic novel sees the rebellion of the quote-unquote supervillains as they try and attempt to stop Sheldon and Walter. It's an absolutely incredible story, and I definitely recommend that you check it out if you haven't already. 
I will be doing a full comic book breakdown on it at some point, but those are the main direction that things are going in. Now as I touched on earlier, the series very much expands upon things and it is possible that it won't go in this direction. If you haven't read the work, then you'll be surprised at how short the arc that happens in the show happens in the comics. I actually think it's probably only about 40 pages or so and it flies by when you're reading it. Depending on how long this story goes on for in the show could massively alter the events and the way that things happen and it is possible that they take things in a totally new direction. Why I think this may be the case is because Walter kills his own daughter, whereas in the source material she actually ends up working with him. I think that for season 2, Walter may weaponize her death and potentially frame Sky Fox for it, making it so that the code seems even more useless. This will have Bran in question whether his dad is really doing the right thing and he will likely go back and forth over what to do with his father. Now not only is the cloning of Black Star pinned on Sky Fox, then Walter's daughter's murder could be too, and it may cause a worldwide manhunt for him. In the comics, Barnabas Wolf, a character that we meet briefly in the show, is tasked with tracking down rogue superhumans, I think that he might be put on the job. He's very much Walter and Brandon's handyman, so do expect to see a lot more of him. Now, though I don't think that Jason will be introduced in the next season, I do think that Chloe's pregnancy will be announced. This was the thing that made her really change her ways and after Hutch had been abandoned by his dad Sky Fox, he decided that he would be there for his son. Overall, there is quite a lot to like in the series and though it didn't advance the plot as much as I was expecting, I did quite enjoy it. Now, Sadly, knowing all that I know about the graphic novel may have shown the show in an inferior light. The stuff we tackle here is very much just the intro stuff to set up the story and it's not really until Walter starts to enact his plan that everything falls into place. Now I think that people who don't know what's going on in the comics might just view this as a rather run of the mill superhero show that doesn't quite do anything new. Though I know they'd be wrong, it's difficult to argue against that without talking about the work and going off just the show as a whole, I know that when it's presented on its own it might not blow everyone's socks off. However, the pieces are all there and if you love the graphic novel series, then I think there is definitely a lot to fall in love with. The certain moments such as the shark infested water scene that's ripped straight out of the comics and it does a very good job of bringing the pages to the screen. Now though I think that at points this felt very middle of the road, I know there is a lot coming down the line and I kind of wish they'd done more than 8 episodes and potentially ended it with the big death in the comics. Currently, I am struggling whether to recommend this to people or just saying to them, wait until season 2 drops so you have more of the plot, but either way, you know, it is worth sticking around for. Now one of the things that the series excels at is that it gives far more character development than we got in the comics. You really see the mad and insane journey that Sheldon goes on and the doubt that arises from those around him, driving their motives to question him once more. Josh Demel does a great job of portraying a road weary Superman and both he and Ben Daniels feel like perfect casting in their roles. Though I feel like the old people makeup was a bit hit and miss, this is still a pretty solid first entry in a show that Netflix are referring to as volumes. The acting was great and this is definitely something I think you could probably put on in the background just to keep you entertained for a couple of hours. However, as a fan, I am desperate to see the rest of the arc play out and I hope that we get it sooner rather than later. All in all, Jupiter's Legacy Volume 1 was a good first chapter and I am hyped to see what's next. Our final score is a 7 out of 10, but obviously I'd love to see if people disagree or agree with me. I can see a lot of people loving it and did I not have such a big attachment to the original work, then it would probably score higher. I do think that when it's all out that I'll look back on the series in a higher regard, but for the meantime, as it is, that's where I come down on it. Now there's lots to talk about so get typing, and if you want something else to watch then make sure you check out our breakdown of the finale of Invincible which will be linked on screen right now. That's another massive superhero show that has a lot of things going on in it, so definitely check it out right after this. If not, then thank you for sitting through the video, I've been Paul, I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.